Hi, my name's Mike Jones. I'm one of the cruel people who will drag you kicking and screaming through statistics subjects at Macquarie University. But don't worry, I can guarantee you that no one will come to any actual harm during this lecture. And you might even enjoy it. See ya. And so on with the show. In previous weeks in this stream, many lectures have been about very specific technical topics, such as the application and interpretation of particular hypothesis tests for particular purposes. In contrast, in this week's lecture, I'd like to step back a little bit and talk about some of the pitfalls and things to look out for about hypothesis testing in general, and to talk a little bit about the underlying principles and the history which have led us to the application of these methods as they are typically done today in research and psychology. Particularly about how the application of hypothesis testing relates to the scientific method and the science of psychology. The particular things I would like to look at are some of the pros and cons of hypothesis testing and to look particularly at what, an, what a p-value really is and how it relates to, again, the science of psychology. I'd like to talk about whether p-values are the be-all and end-all of uh, statistical methods in uh, research and psychology, to, to make some connections between experimental and general research design and the way we approach uh, a given data analysis, and to show that the connection is really important. In fact, nothing good will come of not having those two things linked very closely. And to finish with, a discussion of some of the principles and pitfalls for displaying statistical results in graphical form. There is a saying that a picture paints a thousand words, and I think that saying is very true and applies to the representation of our uh, data in graphical form, but uh, well-meaning graphs can also mislead if we don't apply some fairly straightforward principles. So let's start with the pros and cons of hypothesis testing. And first of all, ask ourselves why it is that we actually bother to conduct hypothesis tests. I think the inherent drive comes from the desire of psychologists to approximate as closely as possible the scientific method and to, as well as possible, to uh, represent in our samples what's going on in the general population that we're interested in making inference to. So hypothesis tests are often uh, driven by the desire to determine whether a particular difference between groups that we observed or correlation which we find, is that correlation real or in some sense chance? Let's take two hypothetical examples. This first one might be a um, population of individuals suffering from major depression. We've developed a new cognitive behavior therapy program to treat, to treat depression. We conduct a randomized controlled trial where we compare an active therapy group with a placebo group with respect to the proportion of individuals who are uh, gaining some reprieve from their symptoms. Um, and we might find that the active therapy group was associated with better outcomes in terms of a higher proportion of individuals uh, re having reprieve uh, from depression. Or we might uh, be correlating parental bonding with emotional reactivity in their offspring. Uh, we collect data on a sample of individuals, measure bonding and reactivity, and find a positive correlation between these two constructs in that sample. Maybe the correlation was 0.4. So in both cases, one thing we could do is say that we observe a difference or we observe a correlation, and therefore what the data are telling us is that that exists. And, and we should conclude from our sample that uh, CBT is superior to placebo and that parental bonding is associated with uh, lower emotional reactivity in parents' offspring. The trouble is that we don't know whether uh, the difference and the correlation are representative of the uh, population state or not. And why might they not be? Well, they might not be because we know that uh, through sheer random sampling variability, uh, 
that if we do enough tests or take enough samples that we will find a difference or a correlation in one uh, case uh, by sheer random chance. And that's what I mean here by chance is whether we observe this difference or this correlation uh, through good luck rather than because it is reflective of what's going on in the broader population of uh, individuals to which we're trying to make inference. Um, and so how do hypothesis tests help with that is something that we will look at shortly. And the answer, in fact, has a very long, uh, slightly murky history, which uh, goes back to the early 1900s or even the late 1800s, actually, uh, when mathematical statisticians started to look at the application of probability to problems in health and related areas, agriculture, um, to formalize the idea of testing hypotheses and using these methods to uh, approximate, again, as far as is possible, that uh, ideal scientific method. If you haven't read the book, The Lady Tasting Tea, and find the idea of understanding how we got to where we are in terms of the application of statistics to research in psychology, then this book is well worth a read. It's a very accessible, uh, slightly dramatized telling of a story of how uh, probabilistic methods, which were understood for some time, became formalized into a structure of hypothesis testing, which persists to this day. The title comes from uh, what is alleged to be a true uh, incident um, uh, where uh, scientists gathered data to test an hypothesis as only Oxford dons and their wives can do. But more importantly, it tells the story of some key players in the formulation of the way we apply hypothesis testing today. Starting with, in the top left here, Carl Pearson, back in the 1890s. This is Carl Pearson of Pearson Chi-Square Test fame, which you learnt about earlier this semester. And back in those days, you've got to remember that people would gather data and just assert that the data did or did not support their hypothesis. There was not the rigorous notion of uh, looking for alternative explanations, such as random chance slash sampling variability, which we have today. So Pearson was one of the first to uh, construct hypothesis tests as we know them now, which try to differentiate the signal in data from chance or from noise. And I think Alyssa has talked to you about the idea of hypothesis tests being essentially signal to noise ratios. On his right is Ronald Fisher, or R.A. Fisher as he's often referred to in books. Uh, Ronald Fisher was born in Tasmania, but spent most of his working life in the UK. And these two sadly became great nemesis. Um, uh, they really wouldn't talk. Um, There's a lot of personal and professional rivalry between them. But Fisher, importantly, uh, viewed the idea of a p-value as being a grayscale, or more literally, a probability scale where smaller probabilities meant something was less likely and larger meant they were more likely, but there was no particular threshold above or below which we supported or refuted the or rejected the hypothesis. So Fisher just said you should report the data you have, such as the correlation or the difference in means, plus the p-value, and really let the reader determine whether 0.05 or 0.03 or 0.01 was small enough to reject H0. In contrast, um, some years later, uh, Carl's son uh, Egon and this guy called Jersey Neyman down here formulated a different way of looking at hypothesis tests. They liked the idea of a threshold above which you would accept H0 and below which you would reject H0. So this is known often as the Neyman-Pearson formulation. It uh, appeals to the um, objective in quote scientist because you set an a priori threshold like p less than 0.05 to reject or otherwise accept H0. It takes away some of the vagueness um, that might be perceived to be in Fisher's approach. But it does also create this, this somewhat artificial threshold because there is no particularly good reason why 0.05 is okay but 0.06 is not, or 
why 0.051 uh, would cause you to accept H0, but 0.049 would cause you to reject H0, even though those two p-values are so very close together. So in some uh, research cultures uh, tend to adopt the name and Pearson approach, others take the um, Fisher approach. And which you would take will depend upon um, what you want to do. So what you want to do generally is to make some inference about an hypothesis from a sample, which is often quite a small number of individuals, it might be 20, it might be 100, but to make inference from that population, from that sample rather, to a population. And the question about 0 0.05, 0 0.03, 0 0.01 is really just how convincing that evidence needs to be for you to reject H0 and therefore conclude that there is a difference or, or that there is some association between two constructs. So think back to week five when you saw this diagram here in the middle, which tells you that what the p-value says is how likely is a value of t or r or some other statistic uh, to uh, arise from a population where H0 is true. And these shaded tail areas, if we're doing a two-tail test, if we add up these two tail areas, we would obtain the two-tailed p-value. But what these p-values are really doing is telling us what we think would happen if we had taken a large number of independent samples and calculated the proportion of samples in which a difference or a correlation was seen to exist or not. So really, our p-values are just an approximation to repeated samples. And I say approximation to repeated samples because the scientific method says that to be convinced that a, a treatment works or a correlation exists, we should be able to replicate it. So we should be able to take a number of samples in different locations and different times and find essentially the same result. And so it's the repeated samples which really are the gold standard and p-values which are just an approximation to that.